It is seven o'clock. If everybody's ready, we'll call to order our regular meeting of the Beverly City Council, Monday, October 18th, 2021. Ms. Kent, could you please call the roll? Haynes? Here. Copeland? Here. Feldman? Here. Flaherty? Flowers? Here. Houseman? Rand? Here. Rotundo? Here. And Guansi. I am here. Councilor Rand, could you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Councilor Rand. Um, and now I have to read the script. Script for remotely conducted city council meetings, Monday, October 18th, 2021. Confirming member access. As a preliminary matter, this is Paul Guansi, president of the Beverly City Council. Before we get started, I'd like to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. A thumbs up, nod, or, nod or your head, a wave. Thank you, Dominic, Estelle, Councilor Ames, Ms. Feldman. Uh, good evening, pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting and public hearings will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so in the following manner. It is recorded by the City of Beverly and live streamed by Bevcam on both Channel 99 and via Bevcam's YouTube channel. And we have Kim is here from Bevcam. No in-person attendance of the members of the public will be permitted and public participation in any public hearing conducted during this meeting shall be by remote means only. Accordingly, please be aware that the other participants or viewers may be able to see and hear you and anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. You have the option to turn off your video if you're participating via computer. All participants should keep their microphones or phones muted unless recognized by me to reduce background noise and feedback. Please wait until the person speaking is finished before speaking so we can clearly hear all participants. In addition, because of the remote meeting, I'm going to read Rule 22 of the Rules and Regulations of the Beverly City Council. Rule 22, all subcommittees of the council shall cause records to be kept of their proceedings. They shall report by ordinance, order, or resolve, unless otherwise provided by law. No subcommittee shall act by separate consultation and no report of as a body shall be received unless agreed in subcommittee actually notified and assembled for the purpose in hand and signed by a majority of the councilors of the subcommittee. Every subcommittee to which any subject matter may be referred shall report thereon as soon as possible after full consideration thereof and a vote thereon. However, if the council may by majority vote or any matter pending before the subcommittee to be acted upon, the subcommittee at its next meeting and or to be with fourth return to the full council. For those of you joining us for the first time, we take a vote. If six councilors uh, vote in favor, we will do our committee work as the committee of the whole as opposed to breaking into committee. So Ms. Kent, could we have a roll call vote, please? Ames? Yes. Copeland? Yes. Feldman? Yes. Flaherty? Flowers? Yes. Houseman Rand? Yes. Rotundo? Yes. And Guansi? Yes. Uh, meeting ground rules for public hearings. I'll introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, I will invite the council to provide any comment, questions, or motions. Please remember to mute your phone or computer when you're not speaking. You may mute yourself or be muted by the meeting host by clicking the microphone mute slash unmute icon pressing the mute button on your telephone or by pressing star six on your telephone keypad. Please reserve the chat function for technical difficulties, uh, city council comment, and if you are a member of the public and would like to speak, please type your name in the chat. Uh, if you are a member of the public, please state your name and your affiliation before speaking. Um, after the members have spoken, I will afford uh, comments from the public. And that's all we have. Thank you. Uh, so first on our agenda, we have the Mayor's Chief of Staff, Josh, Steve, uh, Chief of Staff, Jocelyn Rell Kershka, 
and Councillor Julie Flowers uh, here to talk about the redistricting map from the 2020 census. Council Flowers, Ms. Kershka, thank you. Thank you very much, President Guansi. I'm just going to do a really brief introduction to, to what we're going to be um, seeing and, and learning about, and then I'm gonna turn it over to Ms. Kersker. Um, I'm going to ask my 10 year old to stop doing whatever he's doing. Emmett, can you stop that for a minute? He's cre creating a lot of noise. Um, so this process, redistricting and reprecincting, is something that occurs every 10 years. It occurs because of state law in Massachusetts. And so uh, Ms. Kersker is going to get into this a little bit more in detail, and she has some great slides to help walk us all through this. But I just think both for, for us as counselors and for any members of the public who are watching or participating in our meeting, it's, I think, important just for us to understand that um, this is something that's not just Beverly specific. It is across all municipalities in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and it occurs every 10 years, every time there's a new census. So following receipt of census data, so in our case, this is from the 2020 census, um, there is a, a look at reprecincting municipalities. And the purpose is to try to, or what, or what the Commonwealth is seeking to, to make sure is happening in municipalities is balance of population across wards and precincts. And so I think one of the things that I learned just as part of our, our little working group that was putting together this proposal for us to consider tonight is that cities and towns like Beverly can either have some input, make a proposal to the state as to what we think might make sense, or the state will go ahead and re-precinct based on the balance of population in any case. So I think it's just important for us all and for uh, members of the public to for us together to understand that it's not something that we can opt out of. It really is just, just dependent on where our population has changed. And so one of the, one of the main considerations that I know our working group thought about, and I know Ms. Kersker will, will elaborate on this, was trying to minimize change to residents. Because we, we know that, I think we all know as people, change is really hard. In some, in some cases, we've been voting at the same polling place for many years. And so we tried to minimize as much as we could where, where there was change ward to ward. Um, sometimes there's change precinct to precinct within a ward. And we felt that that was slightly lower impact um, on residents because you're still going to the same polling place. However, as you'll see from the map that Ms. Kersker is going to present, it's not possible in all situations across our city to avoid changing all residents um, word to word because of how population has changed. So I'm going to just, I'll pause there and I'm gonna turn it over to you, Ms. Kersker, to show your slides. Thank you, Council Flowers. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and thank you, Councillor Flowers, for the introductory words. Uh, my name is Jocelyn Ruel Kersker. I'm Mayor Cahill's Chief of Staff and a member of the Reprecincting Working Group. I have to first thank, thank James Harrington, the GIS master, working in the engineering department for all of his help with the many versions of the map and their explanations. He went above and beyond to produce these images, and we're really grateful for his expertise and hard work. I'm going to use a slide presentation uh, to give city council members and the folks watching at home some basic information about reprecincting and then go over the proposed map. Please note that um, other members of the working group are also present at this meeting and can provide feedback when necessary. Let me start this presentation. I can't uh, this is Greg Howard. I'm just calling in now. Hi. Hope all is well. Same with you. Good. I can't see what you can see. Can you see the presentation? No, I can't see anything. I'm on the phone. Sorry. That's all right. Um, could you see the, could you, I'll try it again. Can you see it now? No, I can't see anything. I'm on the phone. <laughs> on, on phone only. Okay. Thank you. I'm just dialing in. That's all. Greg, she's talking to me. <clears throat> okay. You can describe what you're looking at to me and I will do my best to respond accordingly. Okay, thank you. I'm about to um, start a presentation. How's that? We're good. So good. We can see it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, excellent. <laughs> So we're here tonight to discuss reprecincting. What is it? 
Reprecincting is the drawing of new local district lines. Uh, wards and precincts within a city form the building blocks for the larger le legislative districts that the state uses to govern. For those following at home, um, a ward is a geographically bounded unit used for election purposes, which consists of one or more precincts. So in Beverly, you could be a resident of Ward 4, Precinct 1, or Ward 5, Precinct 2, and each of Beverly's wards is split up into two precincts. The state requires us to do this every 10 years after each federal census. Yeah, why do we have to re-precinct Beverly? Well, again, re-precincting is required under Massachusetts state law, and the law requires that legislative districts be redrawn on a periodic basis so that shifts in population will neither unfairly increase nor diminish a particular voter's voice in government. The basis for any redistricting plan is population. The Massachusetts Constitution requires that districts must be drawn so as to contain roughly equal numbers of residents as determined by the federal census. The working group worked to ensure the smallest amount of ward to ward changes to residents and we considered heavily existing polling places. While looking at the state's proposed map, we kept in mind would re-precincting move a resident's polling place to an inconvenient location? and would re-precincting move a polling place into a different ward. The uh, procedure for approval of new districts is as follows. Um, re-precincting plans must first be approved locally and are generally adopted by a vote of the city council. After this local approval, the city clerk must give written notice, submit maps, and require paperwork to the Local Election Districts Review Commission, the LEDRC. And after state approval is received, changes in wards and precincts will be effective on December 31st of this year. So here is the map of the state's proposed re-precincting plan for the city of Beverly, including some changes made by this working group to minimize the impact on residents. I'll go over our proposed changes one by one and closer up, but please feel free to pause for discussion and questions. If you would like me to linger on this image or another image for a while so you can kind of digest it, um, let me know. And uh, I'll just keep going forward if I don't hear from you, but I know that this is rather small to see, so I have close up images after this, keep that in mind. Should I pause for a minute? A couple seconds? Uh, I would go, I'm just gonna tell everybody to either raise your hand or type your name in the chat and then we'll, uh, I'll give you a heads up when somebody has a question. Okay, Jocelyn? That would be great, thank you very much. Okay. So the state proposed moving a block containing the McEwen School into Ward 1. Our redrawn map prioritizes keeping this polling place in Ward 3. So that's what we're looking at here. I'll move on. The state proposed moving Lakeshore Drive and the adjacent surrounding neighborhoods from Ward 4 to Ward 6. An hour redrawn map prioritizes keeping these residents in Ward 4 so that their polling place does not move a mile away. I'll move on. Moving two blocks from Ward 6, Precinct 1 to Ward 6, Precinct 2 was necessary to keep the district numbers balanced or within 5% of the average population. So these people, like I said, get to stay in Ward 6. It's just a, dis a precinct change. I'll keep going. Moving two blocks from Ward 5 to Ward 6 was necessary to keep the district numbers balanced. That's what we're looking at here. Moving on. Moving three blocks from Ward 5 to Ward 1 and moving one block from Ward 3 to Ward 5 was necessary also to keep the district numbers balanced. That's the end of the slides that I have, but I'm happy to go back and forth or the working group is here to answer your questions. Um, Jocelyn, I have a question. Can you go back to the um, 
one where Lakeshore Drive was was redistricted or not. Yep. So all that becomes six one now. So it's it's not going to become six six one. James, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, uh, could you help me to explain this this image a bit? What what might what's moving and and what isn't? Sure. Well, I, I think what um, what she's referring to is the state um, has sent us a proposed map based on you know what our the 2020 population is and, and how it would balance out if we move the wards. They they made their proposal based on sheer numbers and not really considering what's going on in the city. So when you see that red line um, that crosses Foster Drive, uh, that's what the state proposed to those those two blocks would move into Ward 6. So we decided, well, we, we don't want to do that. We want to keep those in Ward 4. So that the those uh, the people who live in that th that those two blocks are now are going to remain in Ward Four, but now we need to rebalance it because now there's not enough people in Six One to uh, maintain a balanced population. Does that answer your question, or too maybe confusing? I'm maybe I mean maybe I'm a simpleton, but if I'm driving down Cross Lane, all the left hand side of Cross Lane now is Six One as opposed to Four Two. Uh, yes. Okay. I'm good. I see that right. Let's go to Council Feldman. Thank you. Um, I had a few questions because there seems to be a couple that are really um, ch shifting the boundaries of Ward 5. On the slide that had Beaver Pond Road, um, the, the shift from 5 to 5 to 6 to, um, you had said two blocks. Beaver Pond Road is really just one long road. And previously the right hand side of the road coming from Dodge Street or the was all five two and the left was six two. Is this that half of it, half of the right hand side of the road is five two and the other half? And then three quarters of it is like six two because it's it's not really broken up into blocks. So I'm just trying to get an idea of where if there's any residences on Beaver Pond Road that are part of five two anymore. Um, just from where you said about two thirds of the way down, mm -hmm. um, are those remain in five two? But the uh, from Dodge Street down until the 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 first major Bend. curve to the left if you're coming from Dodge Street, both sides will be moved into 6-2. Okay. And when I said it says move two blocks, it, the, the, the block lines are very faint. They, they might be hard to see on this presentation, but um, Dodge Street is the boundary of one of the blocks. The, the call out is pointing to the northernmost block and the second block that's being moved is the one south of Dodge Street, the green one that includes Norwood's Pond Road. Right. Okay. I'm just seeing that now as well, because those on Dodge were all 5-2 as well originally. Um, and then my other question is, I thought that I saw on the first slide that there was a shift from 5-1 to 1-1. One, one. Um, up on Radcliffe, I know that half of Radcliffe, which is the southernmost point of Ward 5, um, right up at the top left-hand corner of that screen, I thought there was something that said that one block was shifting. Uh, there, there already is one half a block that is 1-1 one, one at the very top of the ward. Was there any other moves with 5 to 1? Sorry, it was this one. Sorry. There. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so is that, that is, ha is that happening? Do we, that is moving three blocks from five, one to one, one up there, everything south of Amherst? Everything south of Amherst. Yes. Okay. Which I believe 
they were part of 5-1. Yeah, the, everything up They're to, currently part of 5-1. Up to Radcliffe was that those were all 5-1 um, up until now. Okay. All right. Uh, I think, and then is the new bulge that what's moving from 3-2 to 5-1, is that half? Is that one half of the street or is it the entire street? Is no, the just the westerly side of the street. The west, okay. Okay, I think that's all my questions. There are a couple of shifts in five, so thank you. Thank you, Council Feldman. Council Flowers. Thank you, President Guanci. I just was uh, realizing that I think something um, that I'm not sure if we stated as clearly as we should have, but I think it's really helpful maybe for both, again, fellow counselors and also for those residents who might be watching to know is that essentially the state started off by sending us a proposed map where they made changes, as Ms. Kirsker said, based strictly on population and balancing that. And then they give um, municipalities the opportunity to try to look at things that they might not be aware of. For example, an example in our case was McEwen Elementary School on the state's proposal being moved into Ward 1 um which which in then in our working group we prioritize trying to keep polling places for voters consistent and so moving that back and then having to create some balance but i think what's maybe important just for our conversation that i i should have said at the outset is that ultimately as Ms. kersker said the process goes back to the state Ms. kent's office will submit whatever is voted on here tonight but this is essentially a counter proposal to sort of their initial proposal and so i think it's just important for any of us and especially if residents are watching just to know that until you receive uh, formal notification from the clerk's office, if your ward or precinct has changed, to not to not make any assumptions based on what we're seeing proposed tonight. Ms. Kent, is that accurate, what I'm saying? Okay, I'm getting a nod from Ms. Kent. Thank you. So I just, I wouldn't want anybody, I wouldn't want anybody um, on November 2nd to think that you need to go to whatever this is suggesting your ward or precinct would be, people should still go vote where they always vote. That won't be changing for this election. This won't be final, even if it were all adopted. Excuse me, I'm sorry, I can't see you guys. Um, this is Jocelyn. Um, this won't be final until, even if everything was all voted on and approved until December 31st. Thank you, ladies. Uh, how about Council Copeland? All right, thank you, Council President. So can we go back to the, the map for Ward 6, please? Sure. Map area. This one, or? I guess it's it's large altogether. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see. Uh, so for the most part, for, for Ward 6, we're not, we're not shrinking, we're growing. Geographically. Yes, that's what I mean, geographically, as far as the area, as far as our, you know, 6162. We're moving forward into other areas. Can I see the uh, the lower parts of it? Sure. Well, this is the upper, sorry. Oh, the lower part, I'm sorry, that's not on these slides. Okay. James, was were there any changes to the lower part of 6-1? I didn't think so. Uh, not that I'm aware of. No, like the, the lower part, meaning there's a piece of green down on the bottom right of the map we're looking at now, which yes. is part of, uh, off of Hale Street. It includes Prince Street and Curtis Point. That um, That is currently part of Ward 6, Precinct 1. Um, and, the, and the two blocks that we see that are outlined by black lines in 6-1, those were, um, are currently in Ward 4, so those are going to be moving to Ward 6. And so, yes, the, um, the geographic area of Ward 6, Precinct 1, is growing. All right. Right? I think so. And then the lines that we have here, the red lines, that was originally what the state was looking at. The green, just the colors are what we're suggesting. Yes, the red lines are are the uh, is the state's proposal, and the the colored backgrounds are 
the ones that we chose and the black lines are what they currently are based on the 2010 census. All right. So we're looking in some areas like 6-2, we're going to grow it beyond uh, what the state suggests. We have the red line um, here and then there's the green that goes beyond the red. That, am I seeing that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. There are two well, let's see. Uh, yeah, the, the there are two the two pieces there are uh, uh, proposed to be part of six one, but it's just we're just moving it from precinct one to precinct two, so it's still the same board. It's just we've just did that to balance out the population, but the um, you know they'll still be represented by you, they still vote at the Centerville Elementary School. Yes. All right, I just want to get uh, more clarification on the boundary lines and where everything fit together. All right, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Copeland. Uh, before we continue, I think it's a good time to uh, take care of our public hearing, which is scheduled for 7.30. Ms. Kersker, is that okay? You're not going to go anywhere, correct? I'm here. All right, so let's go to, and I'm sure our finance director is on. Let me see. Um, yeah, Brian Ailes is here. Of course he is. All right, so let's call to order this public hearing on number 165 from 2021. Ms. Kent, could you please read that? Sure. Legal notice. Number order number 165 ordered that the City Council of the City of Beverly hold a public hearing on Monday, October 18th, 2021 at 7.30 p.m. remote on Google Meet live stream on BevCam relative to the transfer of 71,900 from the Harbor man, man, Management Fund along with the transfer of 71,900 from the Reserve for Unforeseen. The combined transfer value of 143,800 will represent a required 20% match of two grants received by the city. This was in the newspaper on October 8th. Thank you, Ms. Kent. Uh, Mr. Rails, want to just give us a couple sentences of what, about what your request is? Sure, happy to, Mr. President. Um, the, the correspondence was pretty, pretty clear um, about what it is we're trying to do here. Um, we were fortunate enough um, through the grants office and Ms. Barrett, along with a lot of the work uh, done by HMA, um, their board, as well as um, the engineering department and Mike Collins, to try to uh, obtain these grants. Uh, one is for the commercial hoist and fishing pier as noted in the correspondence. The other is for a feasibility study uh, for recreational and transit floats uh, in the harbor. And uh, both of those uh, require a 20% match. And so the request before you this evening is to transfer funds from two sources to meet that 20% required match. The first source is from the appropriated account within the existing general fund budget. Um, of the reserve for unforeseen. And the second area that we're uh, seeking to transfer money is from the Harbor Management Authority uh, Fund. Uh, and those two combined will comprise $143,800, which represents the 20% match required for both of these grants. Uh, I know Ms. Barrett's here, uh, and along with, I believe I saw Mr. Newman. Um, so we're happy to answer any specific questions about, about the projects or, uh, or the finances. Thank you, Mr. Ailes. Ms. Barron, anything to add before we go to the council? Uh, no, Brian did a terrific job uh, highlighting both of the SEC grants and the required 20% matches. And I just wanted to thank Jerry Perry for his email on Friday, uh, further elaborating on the matches and that he is in full support of both of them. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Perry, you did send us an email with a memo. Do you want to just go over it real quick? Maybe Extremely quickly. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, there are sufficient funds in the accounts to do this, certainly. Uh, so you have no problem with that. And uh, at least from my perspective, matching grants are a good thing for the city. Uh, we're basically uh, going to put 20% down and get 100% back. So uh, even though it's certainly your prerogative to vote on this, it's my recommendation you do so, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Perry. And then why don't we go to Don Newman, who represents the uh, Harbor Management Authority. Well, I don't, think, I don't think there's much more to add. Uh, some of the things to me are 
uh, almost black and white. The uh, we want to support our commercial lobstermen. They load and offload their catch on that fish pier that is sort of falling into the ocean. And for a 20% match, we get to replace it. We also have a new restaurant being built on the waterfront. Hopefully, that's going to encourage more transient boaters and people coming from the water side. So a study to look into improvements in that area is, is equally timely for the city. Thank you, Mr. Newman. It wouldn't be right if we didn't hear from you tonight. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Paul. City Council, is there any questions or comments for our panel? And Councilor Rand. Thank you. Just want to echo my support for this um, project in general and for um, the city making and uh, adding the matching funds and um, making the investment in our commercial fishing pier especially. Thanks. Thank you, Councilor Rand. Anyone else? Okay, how about members of the public who wish to make a comment or ask a question? All right. Uh, I don't see any hands raised, so hearing no further questions or comments, I'm going to close the public hearing, and I am going to entertain a motion to approve the, uh, the transfers and accept the grants. So moved. So moved. Second. Second. Roll call, Ms. Kent. Ames. Yes. Copeland. Yes. Feldman. Yes. Flaherty. Uh, Flowers. Yes. Houseman. Rand. Yes. Rotundo. Yes. And Guanci. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Uh, now let's go back to redistricting. And we were, in terms of questions from the city council, we were at uh, Ward 3 Councilor Stacey Ames. Ms. Ames? Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, I have a general question. So when we look at the, these maps in the process, we weren't thinking anything about like the socioeconomic um, or even uh, distribution or the school population or anything like that. It's just purely population and trying to even it out. Is that correct? That's my understanding, yes. Yeah. I think Councillor Flowers had her finger out. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, that's okay. I, I realized, Mr. President, like through you to Councillor Ames, I realized I wasn't sure how to navigate. No, please, that's fine. Okay. Um, yeah, Ms. Kersker, not to step on your toes, I was just going to to say to Councillor Ames' question, I think there were some instances, Councillor Ames, um, as I recall, in our conversation, where even though you, our priorities were attempting to, well, first of all, the state's priority is balance of population. So I'll, I'll say this, and Ms. Kersker, maybe once we finish this part of the question too, if we um, go back to the, in, the beginning of your presentation, there is the key that has the numbers uh, by ward and precinct, I think that could be helpful. But I do recall, Councillor, in some conversations that we had where we were, what the state was proposing seemed like it was, uh, would potentially sort of plop an, an area, a neighborhood down into uh, a ward, move it into a ward where perhaps it would just be really disparate kind of um, focus or concern or conversation from this one one particular little neighborhood that they were proposing to move. So I think we did try to think about, you know, what what might one ward counselor be realistically also able to to do in terms of advocacy and representation in terms of a ward that that made sense for someone to represent really effectively and be able to advocate for well. I do think that, that at least came into our conversation. Um, and the schools part I think is an important point. So I just wanted to address that. So thank you for raising it. The school, the schools are districted sort of separately from this. So, um, and I think, Councilor Ames, I'm glad you asked it because I'm sure residents would be thinking the same. And that actually came up in our conversation. So, um, the school committee and the school department handles redistricting as needed to adjust for size and um, socioeconomic diversity and balance within our schools. And also, that is a, a process that comes up, you know, periodically, um, but is disparate from how our wards and precincts are arranged for the purpose of voting. I understand. It just, um, 
Ward 3 is one of those crazy wards with approximately, I think, a, a dozen schools in it and no neighborhood elementary school. So it, it's just one of those things that, you know, I just I just uh, was curious about how that impacted, you know, your thinking. So thank you. Um, speaking of the map, I was hoping you folks could just sort of run through part of what Councillor Feldman said about New Balch and that just the McEwen area. Um, New Balch is definitely sort of its own little neighborhood, but you know how it runs, you know, exactly how this map is going to run. So it'll be one half of McKay, it looks like, I think. All of Balch Street. And then, but it does look like New Balch. Is that where it is split? Which would be different? It's just hard. I think there might be a close up map that one of your maps might have had more detail. I'm not sure. New Balch is kind of split. Half of it is. Um, fully in Ward 3, Precinct 2, and then uh, the northern half of it, uh, the east side of New Ball Street is in Ward 3, and the west side is in Ward 5. Okay, and so that will be a fairly major um, change for it. Then also running down to 3-1, it looks like much of a change will be sort of the harbor front from Elliott Street down through Federal and down McPherson will all be, will be, that's all 3 1. Um, yes, everything. West of McPherson Drive basically was or currently is in Ward 1 will be moved to Ward 3, Precinct 1. Okay, so the next Ward Council will have a lot more say in terms of probably the Bass River. And that also seems to make good sense to me because the coming sensor is in um, and Stop and Shop are also in 3. So I think that will help because all those projects, there are many things that happen down there that are tied together. And then finally, as you move up the West Dane um, Federal Street Library area, it looks like you just, Ward 3 will gain a few blocks. Um, yes, just two blocks, um, just south of West Dane Street, north of, uh, I believe, those are Judson Street and Arthur Street. Oh, nice. Good. So I, I'd like to say, you know, in terms of Ward 3, this is, this is um, well done, I'd say. You know, I, I, I think um, New Balch, you know, that's a little bit sad in that piece, but I think uh, generally nice work. So thank you. That's great thank to hear. That made me smile. Uh, let's go to Councilor Rand. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to the working group that advocated from you know your knowledge base of our community for um, re the redistricting. Um, I'm so curious with all of the new units in Ward Two. I didn't hear that Ward Two was gaining or losing any kind of area. Can you show that again? I, I don't know if I just missed that slide. I don't know. There's a larger map. So on the map, it looks like there's some change in Ward 2, but then I didn't see a specific slide about the Ward 2 changes. Can you talk about that a little bit? Is that directed to me? Um, James Harrington, the GIS awesome. coordinator yeah. again. Um, yeah, I I think that the only changes are what we just dis discussed right there. The two blocks that are just south of West Dane Street are from moving from 
to one to uh, to three. Ward three. Um, I, it, I, it appears that those are the only ward changes. I think there might be um, a, a small block way down on the southernmost part near the Beverly Salem Bridge that might change from one precinct to the other, but uh, there are no significant changes to Ward 2, mm -hmm. which is surprising because that seems to be the one that has pretty significant population increase, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so and then uh, now I'm actually seeing on this first map too that um, you're that this shows the variance in population. So meaning what it was when it was um, when the boundaries were drawn in 2010 to now. Is that what what that is? No, that's that's explaining the variance of um the target population. You see that the, there's just above that, it says minimum 5% and maximum 5% and then target in the middle. So it, it the, the the population of each precinct must be within 5% of that target or in between the two numbers. So it's the variance off of that three, five, five, six, I think it is. So I don't have the actual numbers of how it changed from 2010 to 2020. Okay. And it, it looks like actually just looking at it now, it does look like two two has sort of the variance in two two is a bit on the the higher end of what's allowed. Um, I'm so interested to know in your process um, where you did you talk about the patterns of population shifts and was there kind of an, an overall um, takeaway from that just as a working group? I didn't um, consider what the actual changes were from 2010 to 2020. I just took the 2020 data and just did my best to make it work, to fit within those two, within that target range. And it's tricky because, you know, if you take some out of one ward and move it to another one, then it's, it creates kind of a domino effect where, you know, it's it could throw everything off and you have to adjust other other wards, as you see, like just to just to move those two blocks from Ward Four uh, back to Ward Four from Ward Six, we had to go way up north, all the way as far as you know Dodge Street, to adjust Ward Six to make it compliant. So yes, I didn't really uh, do a thorough analysis of what the actual changes in population are between 2010 and 2020 census. Thanks. Thank you, Councilor Ran. Uh, Councilor Flowers. Thank you, President Guanci. Uh, Councilor Ran, I just wanted to respond, I think, at least in part to your question. I think part of um, when we first got the maps from the state, we did, we did talk quite a bit about how it does reflect where you can really see where the density of our population is, just in terms of, um, because, because part of this exercise is trying to create better balance across wards and across precincts. Um, what appears geographically large and what appears geographically small, but then when you consider that the population is, we're striving to, or the state's exercise here is to ask municipalities to strive to put that in balance. Um, I think it is revealing about where there's population density and where um, you know there's the same number of people spread across perhaps a bigger geographical space. So we definitely sort of entered into it, that conversation. I think you know what you're probably thinking about is that does reveal, you know, two one and two two are geographically appear small, but their population density is high. Thank you, Councilor Flowers. Uh, let's go to Councilor Rotundo. Thank you, Mr. President. Just a simple question: um, Ward one one Amherst is that going to be a full street or is that a half street, uh, Mr. Harrington? Uh, hold on, let me, yeah, Amherst, no, uh, yeah, oh no, the, uh, it looks like the entire length of Amherst, the northern so it, half of it will be in Ward 5 and the southern half of it will be in Ward 1. Okay, perfect, thank you. Councilor Rotundo, a lot of doors up there to knock, knock next time. <laughs> that, that's okay, I'll get new shoes. 
All right. Good that the houses are close together, though. That helps. Um, any other members of the council uh, wish to make a comment or ask a question? Ms. Kirster, anything to wrap it up? Um, I don't have anything specific. Um, Lisa, did, did you have anything that you wanted to add? No, I think you guys did great. It was just um, a hard thing to, I think, for all of us to just navigate through because no matter what, there was going to be changes. And we really try to, like Council Flower said and Jocelyn said, to keep them to a minimum. And it's just impossible to keep everything the same because the state's telling us we can't. So we did the best we could with what we had. It doesn't mean the state's going to agree with us, but we're hoping, you know, for the best. Thank yeah, you. Great work by everybody. Uh, Ms. Kent, Ms. Dixon, Ms. Kirster, and of course, Council Flowers stepped right up and uh, uh, volunteered once I asked, and uh, that was great. Very appreciated. And James did. Oh, right. And James Harrington. I think this yeah. is your first meeting that you've been on, isn't it, Mr. Harrington? Mr. Harrington, yeah. We could have not done Yes, it is. Time. Thank you very much. It's Thank been, you. it's, a, it's, a, it's my pleasure. How do you like your new job? Oh, I love it. It's wonderful. You know, we never thought that Rolly Adams was going to retire, but uh, he did a wonderful <laughs> job for so long and was always stayed under the radar. But it's good to see you uh, at our meeting tonight. Thank you again. If I could. Oh, yes. Thank you. It's, it's a tough, tough uh, set of shoes to fill, but I'm doing my best. Yeah, of course you are. That's great. Uh, Ms. Kershka, go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt. Before, I could not see with the presentation happening, so I was just kind of speaking, taking a chance. But I wanted to give Lisa the opportunity to speak and to hear from James again. But I wanted to thank everybody, uh, myself on the working group, especially James, for all of his hard work. Um, it was a very interesting project and um, anxious to see what happens next. Thank you. And the state yeah. would like to. Yes, right. Ms. Kent. I just want to thank Jocelyn too again because she kind of jumped in. Um, Stephanie Bellotti was our leader. And when Stephanie left, um, Jocelyn kind of, I don't know, adopted us with her. <laughs> <laughs> got, she got us with her. So she did a great job um, just getting right to it. Thank you. Good stuff. Good stuff. And we will we'll vote on that uh, later in the meeting, correct, Ms. Kemp? We have a communication from you, and the state would like us to take that vote before October 30th, so that's what we'll do tonight on the 18th. Correct. Thank you, everyone. Okay, next on our agenda is our sustainability director, Irina Keith. It's hard to believe that she's been here one year. Uh, because of Zoom, we don't get to interact a lot. But um, I know Mayor Cahill wanted to say something before we went to Ms. Keith's presentation. Mayor Cahill? Thanks, Mr. President. I, I just want to say one simple thing, and that's that um, our, anonymous, our anonymous donor um, and I spoke recently, and they are incredibly happy with all the work that we collectively have been able to accomplish this past year, in significant part because of Ms. Keefe's um, incredible leadership and work. And so just want you to know that that, um, that partnership is ongoing. And if, if you remember, the, the agreement was that in year one, the donor would, would um, contribute 80% of the cost of the office in year two, 60, and in year two, in year three, 40%. But just want you to know that partnership is strong and, and the donor is really happy with, with all that's going on. So thanks. Good stuff. Thank you, Mayor Cahill. Ms. Keefe. Thank you, President Guansi. Thank you, Mayor Cahill, and especially cannot forget a big thanks to the anonymous donor. That's really enabled us to do all this work in Beverly. Um, so I think most of you heard from me during the Resilient Together presentation last week in the joint meeting with the Salem City Council. Um, I'm really grateful to have heard your really strong support in implementing the Climate Action and Resilience Plan and to recognize the scale and the urgency of our emissions reductions. Um, just so I don't repeat myself too much, as I know we focused a lot on the resources that came out of the Resilient Together plan, I'm going to briefly highlight some projects that I've been working on over this past year, um, roughly split, in, split into these categories. Um, I will say it's been strange to start a new job during a pandemic, especially as the cases were on the rise um, during my first few months here, um, but we've really been able to accomplish a lot in this period. I say we because nearly everything that I do in the sustainability office is accomplished through teamwork. So 
on any given day, I may be collaborating with planning or public services, including engineering and forestry, our finance department, purchasing, parks, police, fire, and of course, the mayor's office. Uh, I'm also referring to our volunteer committees, including the two that I staff, Waste Reduction Committee and the Clean Energy Advisory Committee, um, as well as all of our project consultants and our partners. Um, a couple of these projects are new this year, uh, but many of them were set in motion um, long before I started, um, thanks to that long list of proponents that I had mentioned, as well as uh, Stephanie Bellotti, who juggled some of this kind of alongside her chief of staff responsibilities and um, Mayor Cahill's climate change leadership. So some of my main priorities beyond the kind of day-to-day -day project management are really to improve our community outreach and education around these topics and to make sure that um, opportunities to participate in reducing your own personal carbon footprint and opportunities to do things like save money in the process are accessible to everybody. So to start energy, um, we do, as you all know, have a series of solar projects that are at different stages in the approval process. Um, in total, they're going to generate about five megawatts of renewable energy um, on city property. So this is essentially on par with the entire landfill solar project, which sits on 14 acres. And this is being done on uh, parking lots in the form of canopies, on ground-mounted systems like the current one that exists at high school, and on rooftops. So this table here just shows you the type of project and whether it's a, um, you know, and kind of where it falls. So uh, right now we're in kind of a holding plat pattern. We're waiting for National Grid to finalize some costs for interconnection. Um, a foundation design is in progress now. And the landfill solar project itself has come online in the past year. Um, about 100 um, homes in Beverly seeing the discounts on their bills as of the spring uh, for community solar. And then the council voted to approve green municipal aggregation um, before I joined in July 2020. Um, and we've since created the draft plan, submitted it to the state DPU in winter of this year. And um, we're patiently waiting for the state to review our plan for Beverly Community Electric. Um, and at that point, we'll hit the streets with an outreach and education campaign. Uh, new programs this year um, include the, that we're actually doing either in partnership with or kind of tracking alongside the city of Salem, include the PACE program, uh, community solutions program with National Grid to help businesses and residents participate in MassSave. Oh, I see. And then um, electric vehicles. So replacing internal combustion engines with electric vehicles is a really impactful move. Um, we've taken big strides with EVs in the city that are kind of generally grouped into these three categories that you see here. So the first being you know, our fleet. The, how long is it going to take for us to transition our fleet? How much is it going to cost? How do we do a deal with things like police cruisers and heavy duty vehicles? Um, so we have participated in the National Grid um, Fleet Advisory Services Program um, to get a sense of what that, that transition and that kind of pathway toward full ele electrification looks like. And we're also exploring, and you'll notice with the first two <coughs> buses, uh, the full electrification of our school bus fleet as well. And we already have a handful of um, police vehicles that are um, on the road right now and running as electric. And then the kind of second category Oh, actually, I just want to brag, too, you may have seen in the headlines in the past week uh, some news about our first electric school bus. Um, it's the first in New England to send electricity back to the grid during peak demand periods in the afternoon when all the ACs are blasting. <clears throat> uh, and we're going to need charging stations to, um, as infrastructure to kind of enable the full transition community-wide. Now we have 23 ports available to the public that will charge a vehicle in about two hours. Um, that's enough time for dinner or show downtown. Um, we're also about, we're, you know, we had awarded a project for, for fast chargers uh, located at one of our downtown lots to um, speed that up. We also know that there's private companies and landowners that are stepping up and installing charging stations on private property as well. So, uh, the third kind of category here is community education and resources. So we were just offered an opportunity to participate in a pilot program um, to do just that it's kind of one-on-one -on -one coaching, um, a network where you can connect with people who have experience with the vehicle type um, that you're interested in. 
I think primarily because many people aren't aware of the $9,000 in federal and uh, state incentives that are available to Massachusetts residents, let's say myself included, uh, as of or until a few months ago. Um, and that really changes the math around a you know, green resource that has historically been out of reach for the majority of people. Uh, and all this said, you know, EVs are part of the solution. They are not the full solution. Um, planning and our planning department and public services do follow the complete streets principles that improve pedestrian and cyclist mobility and make it easier to and safer to move around so that you never need to turn on your um, engine for local trips, whether it's gas or battery fueled. And then I do want to highlight there's a five minute video that we'll be posting and I think the city's first Instagram Reels or Facebook Live, if one of if I can figure out how to do it and get with the times. Uh, that's a community showcase uh, that was created by Changes Simple on our behalf, um, talking about our, our bus. <clears throat> so I saw that some of you had shared the community meeting that we had last Thursday. Um, and if you weren't able to attend, I do invite you to learn and discuss with us during the next meeting this Thursday. And um, we will be recording the second session and we'll cover a lot of this waste reduction comment. Um, in general, I think we've been upping our community education game through things like this mailer that you see on the right um, that's so far made it to about a quarter of Beverly Homes. Um, and then our presentation that is intended to kind of clearly communicate major changes in the contract, other data on how Beverly stacks up to other communities and all of our, these other ways to reduce solid waste. And speaking of, I think some of these programs you've heard before, seen before, maybe already participated in them. Uh, we know that about 10% of households participate in a curbside compost pickup program. And now we're setting up a free community co compost drop-off station um, that will be up and running this week. More information coming to you soon. Uh, and that's primarily intended to serve the people who live in apartment buildings and can't access a curbside bin or for those to whom the $92 a year is a financial barrier. And then for recycling, this tiny photo here is from our recycling audit where we learned that our community has about a 25% contamination rate. So things like these community meetings, the mailers, the events are all to continue to expose residents kind of over and over to the do's and don'ts, um, knowing that recycling rules are dynamic and they're sometimes nuanced and, and confusing. So um, the city has also taken on some more of the response, the kind of management responsibilities for textile recycling. And we hope that every fiber uh, that is of useful textiles that can be diverted from the incinerator is. And then just wanted to highlight two kind of in pro progress projects. The first is uh, that I've been exploring our permit process for public events to in, at a minimum require recycling and better yet um, also uh, provide resources and assistance to those who are planning events like borrowing our recycling carts, for example. We're also considering uh, joining the many municipalities that um, incentivize backyard composting We've done some research on these bins and if we do it we want to do it right we want it to succeed so it's something we may be rolling out in the spring uh, and this little call to action for the council here is um, to check out that thursday meeting and then also a more you know uh, if trash isn't riveting enough as its own standalone meeting there's also a community event that's co-organized by uh, new entry farm green beverly and uh, with support from the waste reduction committee to smash and compost pumpkins. <laughs> so um, I do believe the rumors that there may be a trebuchet, trebuchet uh, or a catapult to really smash uh, your pumpkin with some style. Next is resilience and adaptation. So um, I primarily served a supporting role in the coastal resilience projects um, whose first phases have been spearheaded by engineering and planning. Um, including the feasibility analyses for the uh, sewer pump station on Water Street and for the erosion at Obear Park, um, as well as some of the, an early investigation of the flood risk of the Bass River area, working with our GIS coordinator on some of the data visualization. And early this spring, we issued and awarded a request for bids that resulted in 50 new street trees planted um, in some of the neighbors that are neighborhoods that lack tree coverage, uh, attempting to kind of also keep track of the many trees that Phil Klemowitz's team plants all over the city. 
And finally, uh, the city, the council opted out of the citywide mosquito spraying months ago. And as a next step, um, we've had some discussions around making official the city's good landscaping and planting practices to kind of further support our pollinators. And just sharing some other fun stuff going on. Um, noting, for example, that I'm working with the planning department on um, creating the first a host community agreement in the Commonwealth that is going to require a series of energy mitigation measures uh, to cannabis cultivators. We are also reporting apartment buildings that don't offer recycling. That is illegal, FYI. You can let me know if you see if you know of any offenders. Uh, fun events like Lobster Fest, where the Waste Reduction Committee and their team of volunteers had um, served, you know, after having served 1,200 or so meals, um, ended up generating just one single bag of trash. And we're um, exploring the installation of bike racks downtown in collaboration with planning. Um, here, this photo on the upper right is taken from um, the city hall participation in the bike to work week a few months, a few weeks ago. And then this event was um, in collaboration with the library. There was a pollinator planting and a story time um, where kids could directly plant a bunch of milkweeds, it's gonna attract monarch butterflies. So uh, I just fired off kind of a lot so you can get a glimpse of our progress over the past year over a range of product projects. So even if the scope of any one of these projects is small, I think they're all heading in the right direction um, toward our mitigation and resilience goals. So just highlighting here, a few resources that I hope you have become familiar with. Uh, the first is the sustainability website. This is you know, new in the past year, of course, um, and covers all of the topics that I mentioned today. And um, there's also some new content that um, I've created in coordination with our engineering department on the trash and recycling page, um, as well as the dashboard of Resilient Together that you had heard about last week. And with that, that is all. Thank you. Wow. That's a lot of information. You've been very busy the past year. Yes. I would say the position is going to continue into the future, correct, Mayor Cahill? Oh, sure. <laughs> well, you know, Ms. Keefe has been, she's been amazing. Um, the work's been exciting, I think, for all of us. And it's just, it, this is a part of our world. We've got a lot, we've got a lot of work to do on every front that, that, uh, that Ms. Keefe represented there. So. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you all for being so supportive of the work and, and being so engaged in it as well as partners. Uh, any quick questions or comments for Ms. Keefe? Dominic Copeland has raised a hand. Councilor Copeland. Yes, thank you, Council President. So uh, a couple quick uh, questions. Uh, you mentioned the bus sending electricity back to the grid. And first of all, thank you for all your work that you're doing, it's amazing. Um, you mentioned uh, the bus sending electricity back to the grid. Now, how does that work on our, our behalf? Are we selling that back to the grid? Is that a potential revenue stream? Is it something that goes back free to the city? It is sold back to the grid. So National Grid does um, pay Highland Electric, the bus partner that we're working with at the middle school, um, for that electricity. And that's kind of built into the financial model that we had um, agreed upon for that first bus. That's right. I remember that for Highland to um, finance the buses, uh, it was less because they were getting money by charging back that the electricity to the grid. All right. And then uh, for the composting, uh, any plans or thoughts on how we're going to wind that within the city as far as uh, potentially making that maybe a little more affordable or, or maybe financing that a little bit through the city? Uh, any plans? So the, the optional um, opt-in curbside compost pickup program um, there are three vendors that serve Beverly and the city offers incentives for people that are interested in signing up. So the incentives include uh, $20 off of the trash bill, that's $5 off per quarter. So that cuts down the price you know, effectively to 72 bucks per year. We also provide a free rolling compost bin that's valued at $28 and costs us $28, uh, as well as a curbside, a, a countertop bin that's a small one for your food scraps. And if the pilot for this drop-off station goes well and people treat the site with respect, they take care of it, uh, and we have a feedback form in place for people to identify other locations where they'd like to see a bin, and maybe you know I could envision in the future a scenario where we have these sites 
kind of dispersed throughout the city where there's greatest need. All right, and one last question. I apologize for taking the time, but um, oh. for J uh, JRM, for where they're going to be uh, hosting the, the composting, is that going to be at the same location uh, that they're currently using within Ward 6? The compost drop-off site, it's really just one bin. It's a, it's a 64 gallon toter that's going to um, be sited at the parking lot to Bessie Baker Park. And I owe you an email, so I'm going to send everybody a couple of slides with all the information that you can share with your constituents if they're asking about these kind of more affordable options to compost. It is not JRM. Uh, Black Earth Compost is our partner. Black Earth. Okay. This one. All right. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilor Copeland. Councilor Ames. And yeah, I said Councilor Ames. Thank you. Um, I just have one quick comp comment. Number one, we're excited in the Ward 3 that the compost bin will be there, the first pilot. Really excited about that. Um, and I put up a post on Facebook about um, waste this past week, and a constituent wrote back about the cost involved and suggested that it's, you know, he put out there, well, what would happen if people got composting free and the people who did not get com did not compost had to pay a fee because they were producing more trash. And I just, you know, maybe not this year, maybe not next year, but I thought that it was a really interesting um, concept because you're essentially rewarding people financially for behavior that will save the city and each other money, reduce the waste stream, and make us a lot more environmentally, you know, sound. So I just thought you don't even have to respond, but I thought it was an interesting comment by the constituent. Thank you, Councilor. I can respond briefly if you'd like. That might have been the same constituent that did attend our uh, first session and made that comment which is an interesting idea, but um, we are balancing kind of carrots and sticks here. So the carrot right now being that you get a you know reduction and discount for, that's essentially equivalent to the amount that you're reducing your waste by to about 20%. Thank you both. I think that's it, Ms. Key. Thank you so much. Keep up the good work and keep us in the loop. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Mayor Cahill, good hire. Uh, let's go to our meeting now. Back to our regular agenda. I would entertain a motion to accept the minutes of three sets of minutes. The first from September 28th, 2021, it was a regular city council meeting. The second from June 7th, 2021, a regular city council meeting. And the third uh, set of minutes from June 14th, 2021, it was a meeting of the Public Service Committee and the Committee of the Whole. So moved. Second. And roll call, Ms. Kent. Ames? Yes. Copeland? Yes. Feldman? Yes. Flowerty? Yes. Flowers? Yes. Rand? Yes. Rotundo? Yes. And Guasi? I am a yes. Thank you, Ms. Kent. Uh, communications from His Honor the Mayor. Order number 181, dear Honorable City Council, I am pleased to inform you that the City of Beverly has received an anonymous $4,000 donation for the Council on Aging. This donation is intended for the purpose of installing two bottle filling systems in the cafeteria and the near the bathrooms on the main floor at the Senior Center. Mass General Law, Chapter 44, Section 53A requires both City Council and Mayor approval before any grants, earmarks, donations, or gifts to the City can be expended for their prescribed purpose. I therefore request the City Council approve this donation by taking action on this matter tonight. Thank you, sincerely yours, Michael P. K. Hill, Mayor. And this seems pretty simple, so I would entertain a motion to gladly accept the donation. So moved. Second. And a roll call. Ames? Yes. Copeland? Yes. Feldman? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Flowers? Yes. Rand? Yes. Rotundo? Yes. And Guansi? Yes, and I'm sorry, I meant to acknowledge that Council Flaherty joined us a little while ago. Good to see you, Tim. Uh, go on, Ms. Kent, please. Order number 182. 
Dear Honorable City Council, I hereby by a point subject to your review and recommendation, Ms. Megan Jones, 17 Columbia Road, Beverly, to serve on the Conservation Commission. Her term will be effective until June 30th, 2024. Sincerely yours, Michael P. Cahill, Mayor. And please refer that to the Committee on Legal Affairs. Order number 183, Dear Honorable City Council, I hereby appoint, subject to your review and recommendation, Mr. Barron's Whitfield at 22 Federal Street to serve on the Council on Aging. His term is to be effective until June 30th, 2024. Sincerely yours, Michael P. Cahill, Mayor. Definitely one of the coolest guys in the city of Beverly, musician extraordinaire. Let's refer that to the Committee on Public Services. Order number 184, Dear Honorable City Council, I hereby appoint, subject to your review and recommendation, Mr. Aaron Swiniak at 2 Brimble Ave and Mr. David Gannon from 4 William Street, Beverly, to serve on the Commission for Disabilities. Their terms are to be effective until November 1st, 2024. Sincerely yours, Michael P. Cahill, Mayor. I mean, please refer the, that to the uh, Committee on Public Services. That's nice to see that they're not reappointment. It's four new people that want to get involved here in the city, and we need that. Ms. Ken. Order number 185. Dear Honorable City Council, I am pleased to inform you that the City of Beverly has been awarded a $6,963 grant from Senior Care. This Title III-B funding will support the Council on Aging's outreach program. The Senior Center's outreach program staff members may contact the seniors, especially those identified as having the greatest economic and social need. Through a comprehensive program of client finding information and referral, wellness, education, and advocacy. Staff assists Beverly's older adults with fuel assistance in SNAP applications, as well as with other social services requested. Also, staff visit senior housing units to provide residents with information about services available through the senior center. Home visits are also made when an elder is homebound and in need of services. Title III B funding through Senior Care, Inc. allows the outreach department staff to perform outreach to an additional 500 new clients not previously engaged in services with the Beverly Council on Aging. Mass General Law, Chapter 44, Section 53A, requires both City Council and Mayor approval for any grant, earmark, donation, or gift to the City can be expended for their prescribed purpose. I therefore request the City Council approve this grant by taking action on this matter tonight. Sincerely yours, Michael P. Cahill, Mayor. Thank you, Ms. Kent. And our Director of grant has, Grants has been patiently waiting uh, to make a comment on this. Ms. Barrett. Thank you, Council President Guansi. I just want to say thank you to our Senior Center Director, Marianne Holak, and Assistant Director, Samantha Casso, for securing this annual grant for our seniors. Um, the last 18 plus months have been incredibly challenging for our senior population, and this grant funding is really critical to uh, do outreach to our, our senior population. and. Um, we do receive this grant each year, but you know, grants are not, not guaranteed. You have to apply for them each year. So we're very grateful to receive it to support our seniors. So I'm hoping that you approve. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barrett. Any questions from members of the council? Hearing none, I would entertain a motion to accept the grant. So moved. So moved. Second. Second. And a roll call. Ames? Yes. Copeland? Yes. Feldman? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Flowers? Yes. Rand? Yes. Rotundo? Yes. And Guansi. Ms. Kent? Oh, yes. I was, I was looking at the next appointment. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm a yes on that. Okay. Order number 187, I hereby, dear Honorable City Council, I hereby reappoint subject to your review and recommendation, Mr. Kevin Gallant, 17 Cena Road, to serve on the Commission for Disabilities. His term is to be effective until November 1st, 2024. Sincerely yours, Michael P. Cahill, Mayor. I'll refer that to the Committee on Public Services, but Ms. Kent, did you miss order number 186? That was the grant. Oh, no, <laughs> yes, I did. Sorry. Order 186, Dear Honorable City Council, I hereby appoint, point subject to your review and recommendation, Mr. Kevin Hoban, 6 Gardner Street, Beverly, to serve on the Beverly's Parks and Recreation Commission. His term will be effective until December 31st, 2023. Sincerely yours, Michael P. Cahill, Mayor. 
Uh, please refer to the Committee on Public Services. Outstanding appointment. Mr. Hoban still wants to be involved. He was our Ward 4 counselor for four terms back in the early 2000s. Right, Council Flaherty? Absolutely. Great man. Always a voice of reason and always made everybody smile. Good guy. All right, let's go to communications from other city offices and boards. Order number 188 from the city clerk, approval for the re-presenting plan for the city of Beverly. Uh, I would entertain a motion to approve that plan as submitted. So moved. Second. And a roll call, Ms. Kent. Ames? Yes. Copeland? Yes. Feldman? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Flowers? Yes. Rand? Yes. Rotundo? Yes. And <coughs> Even though I have to vote at the Centerville School as opposed to the Cove School next time, I'm you going to know approve. that. That's not a given. Don't tell the public that yet. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> but I said yes anyway. Thank you. 189. Order 189, communication from Alan Talbert Jr., Sa Salem and Beverly Water Supply Board, FY 2023 assessment report. And I'd entertain a motion to receive that and place it on file. So moved. Second. Roll call. Ames? Yes. Copeland? Yes. Bellman? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Flowers? Yes. Rand? Yes. Rotundo? Yes. And one C. Yes. Order number 190. Communication from the CPC board for the fiscal year 2022 budget. I'd entertain a motion to receive that and place that on file also. So moved. Second. Second. And a roll call. Ames? Yes. Copeland? Yes. Feldman? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Flowers? Yes. Houseman? Rand? Yes. Rotundo? Yes. And Guansi? Yes. I would have to take a motion. Yes, Ms. Kent. I'm sorry. Um, in this letter, it does ask for approval. So does that? Oh, it does. Yeah. Okay. So you said place it on file. So does that I know, make because that's what the person that does my notes wrote, receive and place on file. Who does that? You. <laughs> um, all right, we'll take that, we'll rescind that vote, and I would entertain a motion to uh, approve the Community Preservation Committee CPC final year budget 2022. So, so moved. Second. And a roll call, Ms. Kent. Ames? Yes. Copeland? Yes. Feldman? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Flowers? Yes. Rand? Yes. Pretendo? Yes. And Guansi? Yes. Now, I would entertain a motion to accept the late file from Councilor Ames. So moved. Second. Roll call. Ames? Yes. Copeland? Yes. Feldman? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Flowers? Yes. Rand? Yes. Pretendo? Yes. And want to see. Yes. And Ms. Kent, you have Ms. Ames's letter? I do. Would you like to read it? Sure. Dear okay. Honorable City Council, there is a widespread support and growing interest in adding more pickleball courts in the city. I have heard many requests from my constituents to attract, address the lack of public re resources for the sport of pickleball. To constructively respond to this issue, Council Flowers is chair of public services that I will be scheduling a community conversation for the Public Services Subcommittee to engage on the viability of creating dedicated pickleball space in Beverly apart from established tennis courts and determine what possible new steps can be taken on behalf of the public. Thank you in advance for your assistance in this matter. Sincerely, Stacey Ames, Ward 3 Counselor. Thank you, Councilor Ames. So we'll refer that to the Committee on Public Services. I think this is a great thing. I mean, we have Marty Goldberg, uh, who lives half the year here in Beverly, half in Florida. She's a world-renowned pickleball player, and she's been on us for a long time about uh, getting the sport some more recognition and some more playing services. So great idea, Council Ames. And you'll let everybody know when you schedule that with Council Flowers. Okay, let's go to motions and orders. 
<laughs> order number 178 be entertained by the city of council city council of the city of beverly as follows in the year 2021 an ordinance amending an ordinance relative to chapter 270 vehicles and traffic section 270-49 on street parking handicap parking amending section 270-49 as follows add a handicap sign to be placed at 37 pond street and three foster terrace first reading was on october 4th 2021 it was public public in the paper October 8, 2021, and in the final passages tonight on October 18, 2021. Thank you, Ms. Kent. Any questions or comments? Uh, I would entertain a motion to approve the ordinance. So, second. And a roll call, Ms. Kent. Ames? Yes. Copeland? Yes. Feldman? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Flowers? Yes. Rand? Yes. Rotundo? Yes. And Guansi? Yes, thank you. Reports from committees. Um, order number 167, the appointment from Mr. Richard Vincent of the to the Greater Beverly Chamber of Commerce representative on the Parking and Traffic Commission. And he is here tonight. Mr. Vincent, you're here. Do you want to make any, uh, uh, any comments? Say how much you love the job. Are you looking forward to it? Uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, President Guanci, uh, very much looking forward to it. Uh, you know, just to be aware that uh, I will be taking the place of Director uh, Leslie Gould, who uh, has to step out of that seat. That's great. And Mr. Vincent's also an important member of the city's ECDC. Uh, committee. Very involved and uh, a big help to us all. Um, I would definitely make an, uh, I would entertain a motion to approve the appointment. So moved. Second. Second. Roll call. Sorry, Ames? Yes. Copeland? Yes. Feldman? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Flowers? Yes. Rand? Yes. Rotundo? Yes. And Guansi? Yes. And Richard, thank you for hanging on and uh, good luck. You know the council's here if you ever need anything. Uh, thank you very much. Take care. Next, Ms. Kent. Order number 174 from Legal Affairs. Um, I hereby, re oh, I'm sorry, reappoint Mr. Kevin Andrews to serve as an alternate member of the Board of Appeals. Entertain a motion to approve that appointment. So moved. Second. Roll call. Ames? Yes. Copeland? Yes. Feldman? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Flowers? Yes. Rand? Yes. Rotundo? Yes. And Guansi? Yes, and anybody that wants to serve, volunteers to serve on the uh, Zoning Board of Appeals really deserves a gold star. That's a tough committee to be on. Um, anything else from committee, Ms. Kent? Yes, order number 180 mm -hmm. from Legal Affairs, the appointment of Mr. Gregory Howard to serve on the Beverly Historic District Commission. I'm not sure if he's here tonight. He was. Christi yeah, I thought Christine invited him. Yeah, that's okay if he went home. I mean, Greg's known by many of us, and I'm sure he'll do a uh, great job. I would have liked to hear from him again, but he already spoke. That's cool. Uh, I would entertain a motion to approve the appointment. So moved. Second. And a roll call. Ames? Yes. Copeland? Yes. Feldman? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Flowers? Yes. Rand? Yes. Rotundo? Yes. And Guansi? Yes. Order number 166 from Public Services. Re reappointment for Mr. Mark Casey, trustee of the David S. Lynch Park Fund, Public Park Fund. I would entertain a motion to approve that appointment, reappointment. So moved. Second. And a roll call. Ames? Yes. Copeland? Yes. Thelman? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Flowers? Yes. Rand? Yes. Rotundo? Yes. And Guansi? Yes. That's all I got. 
That's all we have. So, but we do have to go into executive session, but I just wanted to make a couple of comments before we did, because this is our last meeting before the city's municipal election. I guess Councilor Ames wants to preempt me. Councilor Ames, go ahead. I would never preempt you, Mr. President. I just have okay. one small announcement. No, I just um, want to last, so you can okay, go. Okay, that's fine. Just quickly, um, this Saturday, from one to four, um, the Gloucester Crossing neighborhood is having another um, cookout at Holcroft Park for the neighbors and people just in the area. And there'll be pumpkin decorating and it's just an all around good time. So, you know, come on down, have a hot dog, a hamburger, and decorate a pumpkin. That's all I have, thanks. Good stuff. Seeing that I own a business in Ward 3, if you guys need anything, stop by and visit me. Happy to make a donation, okay? Thank you very much. Uh, anybody else? Okay, last meeting before the municipal election, which will be held on November 2nd. Our next meeting will be November 8th. I just want to wish all my colleagues uh, good luck. Council Flowers, you know you're going to be here somewhere, that's for sure. Uh, Council Rand and Council Copeland and... As the only contested races, I wish you the best. You're doing a great job, and hopefully your constituent, constituents will agree with that. Uh, Councilor Rotundo, Councilor Houseman, Councilor Feldman, uh, we hope that you beat the blanks, and I'm sure you will. Uh, you've all served very admirably. Uh, great to see everybody signs. Ms. Kent's waving to me. What's up? Did I forget something? I actually was waving my husband, but I do have something oh. to say. Okay. Um, but when you're done. Uh, and it's nice to drive around and see everybody signs up. So get out there the next couple of weeks, knock on some doors, meet as many people as you can. Uh, that make a difference. Now, Ms. Kent. I just want to remind everybody that there's early voting on Saturday at City Hall from 9 to 1. So if anybody wants and they can't get to the polls on November 2nd to come down and visit us at City Hall. Also, you can have a mail-in ballot that anybody can request, just let me know or let somebody in our office know and we'll send you an application out there. So if you can't make it to the polls, you still can vote. And I know we have some candidates that have um, been paying attention to our meetings, which is always good. And I wish them all the best also. Uh, Mr. Dole, you are here. That is correct. Good evening, everyone. Okay, so you're gonna help us go through everything. Yes. Um, the city council needs to meet in executive session. We will adjourn from, we will adjourn our meeting from executive session, so we will not come back to a live session. Correct, Mr. Dole? Yes. So I'm going to read what's in front of me so as not to get in trouble and do it incorrectly. I would entertain a motion to enter into executive session pursuant to Massachusetts General Law, Chapters 30A, Section 21A7, to comply with or act under the authority of any general or special law. Specifically, A, approval of minutes of the executive session held on June 1st, 2021, pursuant to Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 30A, Section 21A3, regarding the matters, matters of Burnham Associates versus the City of Beverly, uh, USDMCMA 1, colon 20, CV 11114, Dash GAO in the City of Beverly Federal Torts Claim Claims Act 28 USC 2674 against the United States Army Corps of Engineers and B approval of minutes of the executive session held on September 28, 2021, and October 4th, 2021, pursuant to the Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 30A, Section 21A3 regarding a complaint against public officials, specifically an open meeting law complaint by Joseph Kane dated September 19, 2021, pertaining to the City Council's September 13, 2021 meeting. A motion to enter into executive session? So moved. Second. Second. Roll call, Ms. Kent? Ames? Yes. Copeland? Yes. Feldman? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Flowers? Yes. Rand? Yes. Rotundo? Yes. And Guanxi? Yes. For those of you uh, watching at home, 
Uh, thank you for tuning in. Don't forget to vote on November 2nd. And we will not be coming back. We will adjourn from executive session. Thank you. Oh. What, Ms. Kent? I just saw Todd put his Council of Rotundo's hand up. Oh, okay. No, it was a mistake. <laughs> um, okay, we'll see you in our next link. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>